Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And in our ongoing series on Nobel Prize winners, tonight we're going to talk about Manfred Eigen, who died recently at the age of 91. Dr. Eigen was awarded one half of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1967, along with Dr. Ronald G. W. Norsch and George Porter, who split the other half. They were awarded the Nobel Prize for their studies of extremely fast chemical reactions affected by disturbing the equilibrium by means of very short pulses of energy. Dr. Eigen's work, as described at NobelPrize.org, is during chemical reactions, atoms and molecules regroup and form new constellations. Chemical reactions are affected by heat and light, among other things. The sequence of events can proceed very quickly. In 1953, Manfred Eigen introduced high-frequency sound waves as a way of bringing about rapid chemical reactions and processes, such as the dissolving of a salt in a solvent. The speed of the reaction could be calculated based on the sound wave's energy. He also studied how electrical voltage affects chemical processes. Well, that's what he was awarded the Nobel Prize for, but later on, Dr. Eigen extended his work into various fields, including the biochemical origins of life. Because he studied chemical reactions at the nanosecond level, he provided an understanding of how atoms combine into molecules and compounds, and how enzymes work. And his work, like some of the other Nobel laureates we've talked about, created a new field, evolutionary biotechnology. Manfred Eigen was a nice German boy born in Western Germany. His father was a concert cellist, and he was actually a fairly proficient pianist himself. As a teenager, he served in the German Air Force Auxiliary in an anti-aircraft unit, and the war ended when he was 18. He was captured by the Soviet Army, but they didn't have much interest in an 18-year-old, so they let him go, and he walked across Germany. After that, he began his studies at the University of Göttingen in western Germany with some of the greatest minds of the 20th century. He started out studying physics, and here he talks about some of those professors who included one of his advisors, Werner Heisenberg, one of the great scientists of the 20th century, Richard Becker, and Wolfgang Paul, who also was awarded a Nobel Prize. I did much in physics, in theoretical physics, with Becker, and I did my theoretical physics also with Heisenberg. If I compare the two, then I thought always I understood better Heisenberg's, but we had to do problems, we had to do homework, and I realized that <laughs> one couldn't do the problems easily, so I really didn't understand it. Whereas with Becker, I always had the feeling it's very difficult, very, very, uh, but the problems were easy to do, so one could understand it better. So I did, during my student time, much physics with those, Becker, Heisenberg, in theory, and experimental physics with Kopfermann and Pohl, both uh, great physicists too. Uh, assistant in Kopfermann's Institute was Paul, Wolfgang Paul, who later got a Nobel Prize. A consemester of mine was Demel, who got a Nobel Prize. So uh, it was a great a congenial atmosphere. It speaks to how resilient German science was, even in the rubble after World War II. He finished his doctorate, and in 1953, he moved to the Max Planck Institute for Physical Chemistry, where he did his Nobel Award-winning work. At 27, I got my first offer for a professorship. Yeah. Good. So I started very early. The Nobel Prize, you know, was for fast yeah, reactions. I, I know and it was in Eucken's textbook where it said yeah. there are unmeasurably fast reactions, yeah. and he thought that you mix two substances, it takes a millisecond about, because you get turbulent flow, you do it under pressure. You know. So there's no way the mixing process takes that much time, and if the reaction is faster, then you can't follow it. And uh, I didn't know how to do it, but uh, as a young man, you always you don't believe what they tell you. I so say there's nothing which is immeasurably fast. So I uh, thought of it, but couldn't find a solution. But I learned by studying electrolytes about the solvation and the interactions. Yeah. And there was a problem in physics which was brought to me, that is the high sound absorption of seawater, yeah. which is, uh, one didn't know, didn't have an explanation. I knew it is not the sodium chloride, not the salt in seawater. We soon found out it must be the magnesium sulfide is the next mm -hmm. high because pure water has very little sound absorption. And it has two maxima, so there must be two processes going on. 
And there was a suggestion that one was a magnesium ion, the other the sulfate ion. So I said, well, that's easy to decide. Take magnesium chloride, the chloride ion doesn't do anything, yeah. sodium chloride, and take sodium sulfate, yeah. so you have the sulfate ion, and sodium doesn't do anything. Yeah. And no absorption at all. Yeah. So my conclusion was, this is the interaction. Yeah. And since there were two uh, maxima, I thought it must be a coupled reaction. I worked out all the theory with liking coupled oscillators with normal modes and so on, and it was a quantitative explanation. So at that time, I mem remembered Eucken's words of, there's no way to study these fast reactions. I say, well, the frequencies we use are one maximum, one megacycle, it's a millionth of a second, the other is 100 megacycles, almost a billionth of a second. I say, here you see the reaction going on. So. The trick is, you don't mix your substances. Yeah. You start from equilibrium and disturb the equilibrium as you do it in the sound wave by the pressure wave. And, and that's uh, how we started. And I went to Bonhoeffer, Eugen had died in Berlin, and proposed uh, to study fast reactions this way. And he was enthusiastic about it, gave me a laboratory. And uh, that was the start of the, the, the work for the Nobel Prize. And in 55, we did a very famous experiment. We measured the rate of neutralization. Mm -hmm. That means the proton hydroxyl ion mm -hmm. forming water molecule. And nobody could measure that before. And it turned out to be the fastest reaction we know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even faster than an electron uh, with, with uh, a yeah. uh, hydrogen atom or so, mm -hmm. so on. It turns out not only to be controlled by the diffusion of the two partners to each other, then when they reach a certain distance where the solvation spheres are, they tunnel through it and then. Mm -hmm. So it is really the fastest reaction we know. And you see, at that time, it was almost an Olympic discipline yeah, <laughs> to get yeah, the yeah. fastest possible reaction. And then, when, uh, then all the inorganic chemists came to us, you can now study the uh, yeah. rates of uh, complex formation. Then the organic chemists came to. Mm -hmm measure acid-base catalysis of all types of organic reactions. And the biochemists came, and we did the first studies on allosteric enzymes to measure the control of enzymes, all the elementary steps, because this uh, relaxation spectrum is a linearized spectrum, gives you, like in optics, a spectrum of time constant, you can resolve yeah. mechanisms. And then we start to think, how can this come about? Those finely tuned reactions with control, and so who did it? And our biologists said, of course, Darwin explained it. It's what we said, but Darwin talked about living beings. These are molecules, and molecules didn't know about Darwin as much as Darwin knew about molecules. So that's when we started to think of evolution, and we worked out a theory of molecular evolution, which you can formulate. Yeah. Well, as you can see, his work brought him into biochemistry and then Darwin and evolution and made him ask, what is life? What is life? It's not so much the question, how did life come about on our planet? That's a historical question. In order to find out how life originated on Earth, you have to have witnesses. And since this time precedes the geological witnesses, there's not much we can do. So the questions we can really answer is how is it possible that something like life can come about? So in our case, life is not the historical process which took place. Life is a principle. Life is some behavior of matter. Many people have asked the question, what type of behavior of matter is it? What is life? Well, first of all, we see life now is being represented by the living beings. And there is a huge multiplicity of different living beings. And to subsume them under one word, namely the word life, wouldn't give you much information about what life really is. If we know everything about coli, what do we know about man? We asked more the question, what are the principles? What has to be fulfilled. What has to come about? And we see it's not so much the structures you find there. Of course, I say life is formed on structures. Therefore, 
uh, I'm not a believer in a simulation of life by computers. Why not? Because the computer only does what you program it for. In other words, if I want to program life in a computer, I must program the whole physics and chemistry in it. Because life takes care of those things. Life makes, takes advantage of the, pres of the structures being present. And if, if the computer will tell you about how really the systems that evolve uh, are structured, uh, look like, you must program that all into it. But you can do much more by doing experiments on it or doing very directed experiments to ask certain questions. You can't ask for the principal causes, for the first causes. And I think the biggest mistakes which have been made were to ask such questions rather than to find out uh, what uh, what really happens, what follows from what, and, and, and what has to be fulfilled in order that something like that comes. So life to us appears to be a dynamical process. There's no evolution of single individuals. Evolution is the property of populations. So life as a whole thing evolves up to humans. Later on in life, you used about talent. Each has a speciality, but you have to look for talents. You can't educate uh, talents. Uh, you have to get the right people for, for the right job. Some are good scientists, some are good musicians, some are good artists, some are good engineers, some are good salesmen. We need all of them, but that's something you have to search for, and your education system has to be designed accordingly. There was sometimes the idea you could learn everything. That's entirely wrong. He talks about his work after retirement at the Student Stiff Job, an organization that grants scholarships all over Germany. Of course, you have to make decisions whether you want to be a statesman, politician, a scientist, an artist. You can't do everything, and you have to do what you do. You have to do carefully and as well as possible. So there were often the questions whether I take over a presidency of a larger organization, including the Max Planck Society and others. And I say, this is not my goal in my life. When I'm not a born president of a larger organization. I realized that Einstein thought along the same way. After the war, they asked him to become the president of Israel. And he, he said, no, that's not my business. I'm a scientist, and that's a little bit my credo. But, of course, you have duties towards society. So I thought I looked for certain positions uh, which I ought to do, where I think I have to pay something to society. And one was the Studienstiftung. The Studienstiftung is an organization in Germany which furthers gifted young people in both arts and sciences in the arts, in music, in painting, in sculpture, and, and, and in all the sciences, including the humanities. And, uh, so uh, they must really be top people. There must be real talents. And then they are funded, and one helps them also to produce a thesis and so on. And I thought this was some task for me, that I had to do something in that. But I thought here I can do something to society, furthering young talents, furthering young people. I must say it was a very satisfactory arrangement. I had to uh, talk to ministers and, 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 and make sure that the support was given, but so far it worked out. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Taps. And because one of Dr. Eigen's interests was What is Life? There's really only one song we can close with. It's by George Harrison, of course, who, in my opinion, had the best post Beatle career of any of the Fab Four. I don't know if Sid would agree with that. He's a McCartney man. But in either case, here is our final tribute to Dr. Eigen, George Harrison saying, What is Life? That is